Science is filled with stories, some of them beautiful, and some of them gross. Uh-oh. Really gross. Lucas. So gross that I decided to make a video about one of them every week. Huh? I'm Anna Rothschild, and this is Gross Science. Excuse me. Ew. <laughs>the archaeologist for the city of Boston, Massachusetts. It's his job to keep track of everything that was thrown out, buried, broken, or lost in the city for the last 8,000 years. For a long time, people thought that digging for artifacts underneath big cities was sort of a lost cause. Because cities are constantly changing and growing, everyone assumed that anything worthwhile had already been steamrolled or jackhammered into oblivion. But for Boston, a massive highway construction project called the Big Dig changed all that. People just weren't sure what could still be left from the past in an area like downtown Boston. But what they found when they started to kind of peel away the layers of construction underneath the raised highway were these little pockets of preservation. You only need a couple square feet, um, and that can contain incredible amounts of information about the past. Like this 17th century outhouse, or privy, that archaeologists dug up in Boston's North End. The outhouse belonged to a Puritan woman from 1690, and it still smelled bad more than 300 years later. So a privy is an archeological gold mine. Basically, it's what we live to find. The reason why they're so important to archeologists is that they're, they're one of the areas that you would throw away your garbage. Boston's early settlers never realized that their toilets would one day become time capsules, so they didn't edit the information they threw into them. And as it turns out, the ultra-religious Puritans were nothing like their diaries and historical documents would lead you to believe. So we had this Puritan woman living in Boston in the 1690s who should have been pious and um, demure and all these different things, and it turned out she was wearing frilly lace. She had a bowling ball, which was illegal for Bostonians to have at the time. She broke every single rule of being a Puritan woman in Boston. But what really amazes Joe about the site is how much it went through to make it to the present day. To me, it's like, that's the kind of thing that I live for as an urban archaeologist. Then it makes me kind of paranoid about the whole city. It's like, where else are these little pockets that, that could have a 17th century site still sitting there completely intact? Somebody today asked me if I miss like running around in a field or something. I was like, no, I'm running around on the bottom of the ocean. For the last two weeks, I've been living underwater as part of Mission 31. I was a mission scientist. Hi. You're here. I'm here. <laughs> Welcome to your new home. Thank you. Nice to see you. Are you ready for this? Aquarius is an underwater habitat. It is on the sea floor at 63 feet and it houses up to six people at a time so that you can conduct underwater research. It's a one of a kind space underwater. There's no, there's no other marine lab underwater in the world. And as you can see right outside the window, there's the ocean floor about 63 feet down. There's some fish swimming around. Normally when I'm a surface diver, I'm always worried about my bottom time. When you're diving to about 60 feet, you have about 60 minutes of bottom time without risking the bends or decompression sickness. And that's not very much if you're setting up experiments and trying to do science. But as an aquanaut, as a saturated diver, because we are living underwater for so long, we can dive for up to nine hours a day. For our two weeks underwater, we accomplished what we could have done in about two years from the surface. Matthias Scheutz is a computer scientist at Tufts who studies human-robot interaction, and he's trying to figure out how to model moral reasoning into a machine. But with morals, things get messy pretty quickly. Humans don't really have any concrete rules about what's right and wrong, at least not ones that we've managed to agree upon. What we have instead are norms, basically thousands of fuzzy, contradictory guidelines. Norms help us predict the way that the people around us will behave and how they'll want us to behave. Right now, the 
major challenge for even thinking about how robots would be able to understand and use moral norms is that we don't even understand very well on the human side how humans use, represent, and reason with norms. The big trick, especially if you're a robot, is that none of these norms are absolute. In one situation, a particular norm or value will feel extremely important. But change the scenario, and you completely alter the rules of the game. So how can we build a robot that can figure out which norms to follow and when?